um, you have as well. But ours are a little bit more kind of uh, metaphorical in nature, aren't they? Yes. You have to really study um, Welsh myths to gain <laughs> some sort of insight as to what they might have meant, you know, because it's all kind of like, hmm, shrouded in mystery. Well, exactly. And, and it also might be that we're coming from... Uh, I mean, if we go back to what you talked about earlier, that we, in fact, are on one level then programmed through language and through our way of, of, of thinking. That means that we are searching for, for a, a rational explanation in, in, in the context to these myths. That, and that might mean that we have difficulty interpreting them. We can't, you know, were they talking literally or were they talking metaphors or about archetypes, what have you. And we're still kind of fighting to understand that. But... but in, in doing so, we might be missing the, the overall uh, point, so to speak, of of, uh, of the myth, myths and the legends. And, and what I think it, much of it is today is that it can teach us something about uh, the nature of ourselves and, and where we are coming from and also our connect, connection to the past, of course, um, but, but actually more psychological archetypes in many cases. I think that's a fascinating connection to a lot of the ancient myths. Uh, and I think there's a huge part there that that is uh, fascinating. What, what do you think, Karen? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, this whole thing of like, um, you know, we go to school and our, our imagination um, is completely negated. So right away, you know, this whole thing of like, oh, you've made that up, you've imagined it. Um, it's all fantasy. It doesn't mean anything. And myths come into that realm, don't they? Yes. Come into that, you know, logically you shouldn't accept them because they're just stories. Stories aren't real, you know. And it's that whole kind of attitude that we've got, really, um, which kind of, it, it just negates the whole lot. So, you know, when you can see past that, then, you know, you've got a whole big job then of trying to understand something in a non-linear way when you've been kind of taught in a linear way to understand something, in a logical way to understand something. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's very, I, I find it very difficult, personally, to get my head around certain things. You know, because if you're trying to figure out your brain, then you're fighting a losing battle, because a logical mind makes no sense at all, or anything, um, anything like that. <laughs> And once you accept that and you start to listen to your other senses, then this inner knowing that we all have, um, then it doesn't need to be understood in a rational way because you you feel it rather than think it. It, it all uh, depends on <laughs> what your, I think, what your purpose is as well and what and what you personally want to achieve with, uh, with life, so to speak. Because, again, I, I mean, we were born with, with these two brain halves. You have the left and the right brain, and we have these different... The, the brain has have, have these different properties. One is more analytical and, and linear, as you say, and the other one is more uh, dreamy and, and irrational in that sense, more more uh, uh, inspirational, has to do with art, music, and so forth. And and what I feel at this point is that w- what needs to be achieved is the, the combination of both, uh, the, the ability to, to let yourself go into your dreams and so forth, but at the same time be, being able to use your rational mind and logic when when that uh, when, when those kinds of uh, challenges so to speak uh, pops up in your life you know yeah no i absolutely agree because you can you know if you're just going around in your um right brain all the time then you you're just going to be off with the fairies aren't you you're not going to be grounded no at all yes so yeah you, you have to have a balance of the two but it just seems to me that it's been a very severe imbalance and there still is you know yeah. you know i've got three kids they all go to school they they don't really learn the value of their imagination um you know you're always told to stop daydreaming aren't you at school yeah <laughs> and yeah. that's the thing is is you know it does need to be a balance and i think once that, that balance is achieved mm. which I, I feel is where we're kind of headed really into more of a balance um, then you know wonderful things could happen, couldn't they? Really? Yeah. Yes, indeed. And uh, and I think also <clears throat> one has to understand or or rather have the kind of the the mindset or, or right approach when thinking of, for instance, when when you mention school, that 
uh, I mean, the kids are being trained into becoming workers to uh, to sustain or maintain the society in, in which we live, and and the, the the society is built by by men in most cases with with other motives than than um, you know being interested in in the spirit world. <laughs> I feel so. <laughs> obviously, yeah. we're we're in this very unbalanced you know uh, situation right now. But again, I I go back to that. It all it all depends on what kind of life experience we want to have while we're here, right? Yeah, yeah. Although I do feel that well, I suppose yeah, you know, you're right because if you um, if you are you know like in the indigenous cultures, the shaman would just be a shaman. And the shaman would usually just kind of be in their own world and, you know, or rather other worlds, and and most of the time, well, you know, whereas, you know, if you're functioning in a community, everyone has their unique qualities to bring it into that community, don't they? Yes. Whereas we don't, and that's the other thing, you know, the lack of communities these days, you have to be everything, you know, you can't kind of delegate like that hmm. <laughs> you know i i have to be personally um you know there's a there's the shaman there's the mum who does the routine thing every day you know and gets the kids to school and all that you know and then i you know I, I do a lot of other creative things too as well as my writing so it's just sort of like i don't know and and yeah and organizing things organizing life organizing everything and sometimes i just feel like Lately, I've felt like my brain's just got, like, holes in it, you know. <laughs> I have to write everything down because it's so difficult to remember so much. And I think that's the problem is that people, they're just trying to be everything and do everything. Mm. It's difficult to kind of multitask <laughs> to that degree. Mm. That's, a, it's, that's an interesting point because I'm, I'm thinking of the fact that uh, we are living in a time where, as you say, we have to master all these different skills, uh, and and but to one extent, I, I feel that that is because um, we can't be kind of dependent on on anyone else, so to speak. It's a, I mean, the world is, is weird in that place, or the society, the Western world at least. It, it's a very, we live in these very large cities, right? Very close to many people, yet we have kind of no real contact with them in a way. It's more like if you approach someone, they might look at you if you're nuts, you know. Um, so we're kind of living in, obviously, in this disconnected world. But at the same time, what that might mean is that we have to ourselves become the master of our, of our lives. We have to master all these different kinds of, of uh, you know, properties in order to make our life into the life we want to live, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, a big challenge. Yes. And I'm also looking at one quote, if we go back to uh, uh, looking at uh, Tacos and Ghost Horse here again, at the, he mentioned that there actually are um, many UFO sightings over in the Indian reserve, uh, res- reservations uh, than anywhere else in the United States. I think that's pretty interesting. D- uh, did you talk with him more about that? Yeah, I did, I did. I mean, he's also said that they don't um, know Indian... Um, that he knows of as being abducted by aliens. And I find that quite fascinating, seeing as there's more sightings than anything else, anywhere else in the US. Um, and he also talks about the Watcher. <clears throat> the Watcher, who um, um, is basically a very tall, light-skinned being that appears simultaneously at many different places on the reservations kind of warn them of certain things. Hmm. Like what? Do you know? He didn't say what. He just told me about this being, because his mum's on the reservation, so he quite, like, quite often he'll go there and visit and they'll talk about these things, you know. Is it, is it, do you think it's a, a hostile approach by this watcher? No, I don't think so at all. I think if it was hostile, then, yeah... Something probably quite horrible would have happened, <laughs> but yeah. no. I mean, it all, it seems to be benevolent. Right. But I don't. I don't really know anything other than that. I think it's kind of freaky. I wouldn't like to see him. <laughs> mm. so. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's interesting because again, the watcher has been coming up in in many contexts, of course, in in regards to the 
the the Nephilim, of course, or even the Shining Ones, and that the fact that this is a, a l- very light-skinned uh, man that, that seems to uh, dovetail with, with all the the rest of the stories uh, one can read about, you know? Yeah, I know. It's mm. bizarre. It, this is what I mean. The whole thing kind of links in with everything that um, I've so, kind of been studying. So, I mean, what's your take on that then? I mean, is it? Do you think that uh, we are being visited by um, you know other 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 beings who are trying to teach us things uh, or study us in some way, uh, or or maybe the subject is more eclectic than that. Maybe this is a, a, ver- a, a, a wide variety of different entities and, and beings and uh, sometimes physical, sometimes non-physical that we are having uh, encounters with. Do you think that's the scenario we're looking at here? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I don't, I mean I've kind of sat there and gone, so are they good guys or bad guys? You know? I mean, like, this whole thing is, like, I've always felt that um, human beings come from the stars for one reason, which is that um, anything native to this planet lives in harmony with it. And human beings generally don't, do they? Or they do leave a bit of a mess behind them. Yes. So I've I've always kind of had that feeling. And then, you know, like, uh, over the years I've come across all these different kind of um, people like David Icke, you know, and Michael Desai, and again, and that were the origins of, of humankind. Um, and, uh, you know, so then you've got all these other ideas kind of floating around in your head. Um, so it's difficult, really, because, you know, and then I hear from Kyoko san then about the watcher who watches, obviously. <laughs> yes. So I think, okay, well, why are they watching then? Uh, I mean, you know. If someone was going to come in and um, with an attempt to interfere, and they're going to come actually take the trouble to come here physically like that, when they don't need to, because if if they're multidimensional beings, then they can affect people um, through their thoughts and their minds. You know, spirit mm. beings do all the time. They be inspired with thoughts and stuff. You know, mm. so. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, it, I mean, it is kind of bizarre, really, and I'm really not sure where I stand with it. And I think, at the end of the day, it's probably like it is on this physical Earth plane, that we have, we do have good guys and bad guys. Sometimes I'm a good guy, sometimes I'm a bad guy. And I think that that's, that's the thing, really. I think it's not something kind of definable. Oh, yes, these are the bad guys, so we can all put them in one nice little box and yes. buy a nice label on it and ship it off. Yes. You know? So, yeah, I think that's probably what it is. And that's why I believe that it's very, very important to um, develop your intuitive sense of what what things are and not be beguiled by appearances or, you know, false notions or ideas. You, know, you have to be really quite kind of, uh, have a lot of common sense and maybe a little bit of cynicism as well. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. That that's always healthy. I feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's. I agree with you. It's more of a gray area. I, I feel that way as as well. It's it's not always black and white, and that's simple in that regard. That would be actually quite boring in a sense as well. I feel. But yeah. uh, um, you know, the the, the question is, um, how can one um, uh, develop one's, you, you know, intuitive ability. Do, do, have you found anything in, in the, w- with all the people that you've been talking to and so forth, that there's a specific technique, so to speak, to get in more contact with your, with your intuition? How can, how can one learn that if, if one feels that one is not in tune with that? Okay. Well, I think first and foremost, it's that age-old saying, you know, or oh, I had a gut feeling about so and such, you know. And it's just at that moment when you have those gut feelings that your brain kind of comes in and goes, ah, don't be stupid. You know, it's just really learning to trust what your, what your body says and, and what you're feeling. And, and you sense things all the time, you know. Um, and, and I think that that's it, really. It's just 